Well, now, when the DNC kicked off on Monday, party chairman Jamie Harrison was first at the podium. The South Carolina native reflected on the moment, writing on Twitter, only in America could a round-headed boy raised by a single mother end up gaveling in a historic convention to nominate our first black woman president. Well, Harrison, you may recall, burst onto the national scene in 2020 when he launched a surprisingly competitive Senate campaign against Lindsey Graham. Walter Isaacson spoke to Harrison about the week that was and what challenges his party faces between now and November. Thank you, Biana and Chairman Jamie Harrison. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations. It was a pretty crisp, clear convention with a whole lot of themes. And let me go through them. One of them was freedom. He used the Beyonce song, the John Batiste song. Every speaker hit it. It was a shift from the theme of democracy that Joe Biden was using, an important theme, but sort of a less personal one. Tell me about the shift to the theme of freedom. Well, freedom is just, you know, that's what we're fighting for in this country. And we have seen a full uh, fronted assault on the freedoms of the American people. I mean, you take a look at women in this country. For the first time in 50 years, women don't have the freedom to control their own bodies all across this country. Uh, you know, I'm 48. And all of my life, up until just a few years ago, uh, we've been gaining more freedoms in this country. You know, folks gaining the right to vote because all of us did not always have it. My grandparents did not always have it. Uh, women gaining the right to control their own bodies. And for the first time, because of Donald Trump and the people that he appointed to the Supreme Court, and because of the Su Roberts Supreme Court, uh, those freedoms have been ripped away. The G Voting Rights Act gutted under Roberts. Uh, Roe versus Wade destroyed under Roberts. And then you hear in, in the victim uh, of some of these opinions from folks like Clarence Thomas that said, we're not done in terms of going after other freedoms. And that's why we had to, Democrats had to move forward in terms of marriage equality, because Clarence Thomas and his ilk were talking about going right at that particular freedom that, that has been gained over the course of the past few years. So freedom is a really, really important component, and it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent. America is built on freedom, uh, and we and somebody has to protect it. We don't see that protection coming from the Republican side. We see an assault on it, and Democrats are going to be those joyful warriors, uh, those hopeful warriors that will do everything within our power to protect America's freedom. You know, one of the things I noticed last night as I'm sitting there in the hall, seemed somewhat unusual from my days of covering Democratic conventions, is everybody had an American flag. People are chanting USA. The flag's marching down. The speakers are all talking about USA and patriotism. Tell me about the decisions you all made to recapture the notion of the flag, the country, and patriotism. Well, it's important to understand, you know, when you say that you support the United States of America, then that means supporting what our Constitution says, supporting what the Declaration says. We have had and heard from Donald Trump, his own words, not mine, that he wants to be a dictator on day one, that he's okay with ignoring and sometimes pushing off the Constitution of these United States. Uh, Joe Biden said this also clearly. Uh, you can't just love this country only when you win. This is about loving America all the time. And the Democratic Party looks like America. We represent the diversity and the strength and the values of this country. We believe that everybody, everybody, regardless of your race, your religion, who you love, how you love, how you identify yourself, should live, be able to live their American dream. I can't say that for the other side. Uh, you look at Donald Trump, look at that convention where you saw our convention, where you saw such unity, some happiness and joy. I mean, it was like a big family reunion, right? People are dancing, they're, they're, they're crying, they, they're hugging. You look at the Republican convention. These people had signs chanting for mass deportation. This country built by immigrants, Right. So that's the stark contrast right now between the parties. They're doom and gloom and fear. We're hope and joy. 
And I think hope and joy beats doom and fear every time. Another thing that struck me, which seemed different from some previous Democratic conventions, was the emphasis last night in particular on national security, having veterans in the party up there, having Leon Panetta as sort of an unexpected, in some ways, primetime speaker, with one of the toughest speeches on the need for American defense, and the vice president said it herself in her acceptance speech. Tell me how you were thinking through the need to project that a woman like Kamala Harris, we've never elected a woman before, can be a commander in chief strong on national defense and the military. Well, you know, one of the things that we were thinking is, listen, we knew how strong the VP is. And I think a lot of world leaders know how strong the VP is. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we demonstrated that. This is someone who is respected on the world stage. You remember early on in, in this administration when there was some friction because of a you know, contract, a submarine contract with Australia and France. Well, you know, Kamala Harris early on in this administration was sent as an emissary to, to, to soothe over some of the, the, the frustrations over in France. And she and the president of France have now become very close. And she actually helped to rebuild and strengthen that relationship with this ally that has been a, an ally for such a long time. And so um, it, she's she's met with hundreds of, of world leaders. This, uh, this president is extremely strong, but she's also very empathetic. She understands, you know, she, she comes, uh, she's a progeny of immigrants. And she understands the hardships and the struggles that, that some face in many countries. Her visit to Africa um, didn't get a lot of coverage, but it, it was so amazing to see and to witness, particularly as a black man. And so uh, I can't wait to see her on that stage as our commander in chief, because she's going to be strong, but she's also going to have a heart uh, and, and understand the trials and tribulations that so many, so many face. You know, as party chair, you had to make a pretty strong pivot about four and a half weeks ago. Suddenly, you're planning for this convention of renominating Joe Biden, uh, and boom, you got something totally different. Tell me about that pivot, what y'all scrambled to do to change the convention. Well, you, you know, some of it wasn't really a big pivot, to be quite honest, because when you think about it, in 20, 2020, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris really did not get a traditional convention. Uh, you know, we were online uh, via COVID. They didn't get uh, the, the traditional inauguration. They actually didn't have all the pomp and circumstance for an inauguration. And so we went into this convention, when looking for a host city that could help tell their story and the story of this administration and the achievements. But most importantly, we went into this convention thinking about how do we tell the story of Joe Biden? of Kamala Harris. And so when the switch happened, we knew that we were already preparing to tell the story of Kamala Harris, but now we also needed to be able to tell the story of Governor Tim Walz uh, and then shift how we told Joe Biden's story, not as the nominee, but as the transformational president uh, uh, that he has been. I, I will go down saying, that Joe Biden is the most transformational president of my lifetime. Uh, when you look at his legislative achievements, it is hard to find any comparison outside of Lyndon Baines Johnson in terms of the sheer number and volume and impact of those uh, legislative achievements. And what gives him even a, a little knocks more is he did it with a 50-50 Senate on a good day and a less than five-seat majority, the same majority that Republicans have. And so uh, we, we wanted to make sure that then we could do that. We give the president his flowers, but tell the story of Kamala Harris. When I was walking to the hall, you know, we'd see the Palestinian protesters, and that was one of the things that uh, Vice President Harris had to navigate. And I want to read you from her speech, because she did a very uh, careful navigation of it. She said, I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself, and then she said, but what has happened in Gaza is devastating. Desperate, hungry people fleeing for safety over and over again. The scale of suffering is heartbreaking. 
To me, that was a shift of tone, a noticeable shift of tone from President Biden to just really empathize with the heartbreaking uh, plight of many Palestinian civilians. How is she going to try to keep the party together on those issue, this issue, especially when so many Palestinians feel disenfranchised now? Yeah. Well, you know, th that's what I mentioned earlier about strength, but empathy. And those two things can coexist at the same time. They can be in the same person. And I think that's what, you know, I thought that section of the, the vice president's speech was just absolutely spot on. It, it, was, it, it was beautiful uh, in, in many ways, because that's, that's where we have to be. We can stand with our allies. And at the same time, we can also see uh, the hurt and the pain and want to and and to actively lean into doing things to address that as well. Those, you know, it doesn't have to be black or white, right? It, uh, it, there, there's that room uh, uh, in the middle in order to really pay that path. And I believe that this is the this is a person who can do it in Kamala Harris. And I hope we get it done before she becomes president, uh, because the the need right now is tremendous and it's great. And so I, I know that she's feverishly working. Uh, with President Biden and the national security team day in and day out to try to make progress here and to go and, and secure a ceasefire. One of the decisions that you all who were organizing this convention had to make was whether or not to have a speaker uh, from the uncommitted delegates who were representing the Palestinian cause. To what extent did you have discussions about having a Palestinian speaker? And why, in the end, did you not have a pro-Palestinian speaker during the convention? Well, the, that section of, of, our, of our program, I, I wasn't actively involved in. But, you know, what we tried to do is to make sure we brought folks on that stage that are respected, um, and and had opinion points in all perspectives. And, and there were folks on that stage who had those reflections. I mean, the requests from folks in the various groups and pockets, you know, we're a very diverse party. <laughs> it's, it, it is our strength, but also it, it can also some, at times create difficulties because there's the sheer volume of groups that make up almost, you know, in, in some fashion, we're a little coalition-like. You know, and when you think about the Democratic Party, similar to what you find in Europe and what have you, you have all of these segments and these groups. And what but you but try let me get back to yeah. that issue of whether or not to have that speaker, because it was a two or three day discussion. Are you worried about, especially Michigan, Minnesota and other places, uh, by deciding not to have a pro-Palestinian uh, speaker? Uh, what are you going to do to reach out to that community? Well, I, I think the, the vice president's speech um, laid the foundation for that. She spoke her truth. Um, and, and I think her truth, when you, we, when you talk to folks in those communities, um, I think you see some semblance of all of that right in those communities. And so she'll continue to go and reach out to those communities. We will continue to go and, and get, uh, go to those areas. We'll go to where people are and have the discussions. And not only will it just be about words, because, you know, I'm a firm believer that it's not about just telling people about where you are. It's about showing them. And I think the most powerful thing that we can do over the course of the ne next few, uh, few weeks as we get to November is not just tell people about our position, but to actively show them with our actions. And that's what the vice president, along with the president, are, are working on day in and day out to show folks that we are committed to, to getting a ceasefire, uh, we're committed uh, to protecting uh, you know the Israeli people as well as the Palestinian people, uh, and I think our, our actions are, are going to be much more powerful than just our words. A while back, you said as DNC chair, one of your big goals would be to re-engaging re and winning back Latino and black men who have drifted away from the party. Trump just yesterday was bragging that he's getting black men, Latinos uh, for him. Tell me what you're doing and what you're seeing in that regard. Well, I think Donald Trump continues his delusion <laughs> because he's not getting black men and Latino men. Um, we have been actively, for the last three and a half years, uh, been going around into the communities, making sure that we have conversations with black men and Latino men so that they understand that, that we don't take them for granted. 
that we see them, that we hear them, but most importantly, we value them. And we're going to fight like hell for it. Um, uh, and, you know, everybody wants to be seen and heard. Everybody. And they want, want to know that you have an agenda for them, that y- you understand the, the hardships that they're facing. And I think, you know, the vice president uh, is rolling out things because that economic anxiety is still a really present thing. You know, black men and Latino men want to take care of their families. They, they want to make sure that their security, not only personal uh, security, but economic security as well. And so it, it, it's the most uh, uh, dehumanizing thing for, for men is to feel as though he cannot protect, he cannot defend, he cannot take care and produce for his family. And so we understand that, and we're making sure that our messages uh, are, are, are rooted in that, uh, and we're making sure that the outreach that we do is also rooted in that. This was a historic nomination. First, blah, black woman, South Asian woman. We're seeing history being made. But one of the things that struck me is that uh, Vice President Harris didn't dwell on that in her speech, the historic nature of it. Tell me about what you see as the historic nature and perhaps why she didn't talk about it more. Well, you know, I, I think what's really important for folks is to understand that, you know, regardless of her background, uh, this is a this is a person who is ready on day one to be the commander in chief. There's probably no one more equipped to be so. She has been the uh, the vice president of the East United States for the last three and a half years. She's helped uh, show, stood shoulder to shoulder with Joe Biden uh, to pass some of the most transformational legislation that we have seen in the last few decades to bring America out of the. The, the darkness and despair of COVID, uh, to help rebuild our relationships over broad so that people respected America again, uh, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And she happens to be a woman, and she happens to be of Black and Asian American descent. Um, but it is groundbreaking, because like I said, people will get an opportunity to see who she is uh, and, they, and many people will get an opportunity to see themselves in her. And that's the most amazing thing. This is a historic moment. And, you know, this picture that I've been painting for folks all week at this Democratic convention was this, this image. Because, again, we're a future thinking party. This image of January 20th, 2025, uh, on the steps of the United States Capitol, uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson standing there holding the Bible of Frederick Douglass and Kamala Harris stepping out, putting her hand on that Bible and taking a pledge to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. They're standing on a on the steps of a building built by the hands of slaves. That is what America can do. I mean, it just gives me chills just thinking about it time and time again. That is what America can do in this election. It's all within our power, and we will do that. And uh, we will rejoice uh, in the joy uh, of our ancestors as we as we move forward with that. Jamie Harrison, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.